Good evening, I am Amadi Nubewe. Now the world of politics can be fickle. There are no permanent friends and no permanent enemies. Alliances often shift as new information changes the status quo. This is true for Nigeria, including all its federating units, including Kano State, where the political scenery is constantly changing. Tonight, my guest is former aide to Governor Ganuje and current Kano governorship candidate with the People's Redemption Party, Saliu Dawisu Tanko Yakasai. He speaks to me about his fallout with the governor and his plans for the state if it's be the successful come February 2023. Saliu uh, Dawisu Tanko Yakasai. Welcome to Top Talk. Thank you very much. All right, um, let's start on a light note. Uh, the Dawisu in your name, is that your name or your nickname? It's a nickname. Dawisu in Hausa, that's a word in Hausa that means peacock. Mm. Uh, it's a nickname that was given to me by a friend of mine when I was in school. Mm. And then at that time, you know, uh, by, the, by the name peacock, you know, so it's someone that... Uh, uh, dresses nice and looks good and so on and so forth so uh, obviously because of the way i dress and look good all the time yeah. so right. he <laughs> gave me that nickname and so when i came to twitter i, I wanted to hide my identity mm -hmm. i just didn't want to be known so i didn't use my name i use uh, davisu and i didn't put my name and then fortunately or unfortunately for me uh, the Twitter handle um, became popular mm. and as such later on people got to know that I am I am the one so mm. that's how uh, the name now is. So now. Anonymity didn't work out for it you? It didn't. <laughs> <laughs> All right now um, let's get a little bit of some controversies out of the way so that we can talk more about your plans for Kano State as a governorship candidate. Now um, I think one of the other than being the son of the popular Tanko Yakasai people also know that you were once the aide to um, Kano State Governor, um, Governor Kanuji. And now tell us about that whole situation, because we know that you criticized President Buhari twice. I think the first time in your suspension and then the second time the dismissal. Uh, what really, and this was under an APC government, which you were part of, what really drove you to do that? Well, by and large, um, I think on both on both instances, um, the f the one the first one was in October, and the second one uh, was in February. Uh, and in both instances, it was the issue of um, the insecurity in the country. Uh, I remember the the one in October. It was because of the NSAS protest that was uh, ravaging the country, more or less held the country to a ransom. And at that time, I think about five days into the protest there was no mention by the president or the presidency about the issue there was no no action that was being taken to address the issue and i i felt uh, that was the height of um, i don't care attitude you know you cannot be the leader of the country and then that type of um, security situation is happening in the country and there will not be action there will not be anything mm -hmm. uh, just silence radio silence and i think it was totally um, uncalled for. And the second one was the issue of the uh, uh, girls that were kidnapped, I think over 300 girls in yeah. Tegina yeah. at Niger State. And, uh, you know, um, kidnappers came to their school and took them away. And at that time, you know, as we all know, there have been several uh, kidnappings of uh, school children and so on and so forth. And I felt, you know, it was one too many you know that uh, the, the the president or the or his government uh, by by extension they have failed to up, uphold the number one responsibility which uh, they were elected to do which was the um, um, safety of um, lives and property you know people were being killed were being kidnapped for ransom you know and so on and so forth and i felt uh, you know um, i have a voice I have a voice and I felt I needed to speak up and uh, address the issue of the uh, insecurity at that time that was, it was still, uh, we're still in a terrible situation in terms mm. of insecurity. So that basically that was what happened and I, I, I believe uh, everyone with a conscience would speak up. The least you can do is speak up. 
you know, just demand that the government do the right thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, that is what is expected of it. That is what is expected of us as citizens, you know, irrespective of where we are in the way, irrespective of if we are in the government or not, yeah. that is the right thing to do. And this is something that I've been saying before the coming of APC. We have criticized uh, Good Luck Jonathan's government vehemently, yeah. you know, even harsher than the one we are doing for Bahari, you know. Yeah. So what, uh, if the situation in the security situation at that time uh, was the reason for that, why should we be silent now? If Unless if you are being hypocritical yeah. and there's no, uh, the hypocrisy doesn't run in my blood, so there's no way I will keep quiet and uh, we'll continue to speak out, God willing. All right. You say that um, the least uh, a person can do is speak out, but in your case, it actually cost you. There were there was there were repercussions for it. Yeah. Did you expect that? Uh, and uh, you know what really happened, especially with the issue of uh, we hear that at some point the DSS actually um, you know arrested you or called you in for questioning. Did you expect all that? And what exactly was going on? And at some point, uh, we also hear that you actually disappeared. You know, what, what was happening during that period? Well, uh, it was true that um, I was uh, more or less um, arrested by the uh, security forces, the DSS in particular. And uh, I was taken away uh, from Kano to report it to Abuja. Um, and I think they were just trying to, on their own part, they were trying to, to know uh, for sure if there are any uh, hidden... Uh, hidden forces that are uh, making me to do that and um, they did the investigation and realized that I have uh, I'm just speaking my mind up you know there was no ulterior motive to it and of course uh, because there was nothing to hold on to of course um, they let me go so so that was what um, transpired but um, I think uh, it, it's important for us to understand that you know um, we are in a democratic dispensation, yeah. you know, and freedom of speech, you know, as long as it, it, it is within the confine of the law, you know, it's a fundamental right. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the government needs to understand that, you know, I have every right to speak on any issue, uh, particularly the one that borders around security. And then uh, as long as I do not cross the line in terms of... Uh, um, provocation in terms of um, you know all sort of things that will bring uh, chaos in the land and so on and so on, that would destabilize the peace and security of the country. I think it is within my right to express myself, and uh, and, and I will continue to do that, God willing. All right. So now, did did you um, you know speaking on the the other aspect of some of your condemnations, you were also a bit critical to use that word of. Um, uh, the former Emir um, mm -hmm. uh, Sanusi Lamidun Sanusi. In hindsight, mm -hmm. do you think you were fair in that uh, criticism? Well, I think uh, it's it's important for leaders to understand that if they want to be followed, they also have to follow. Very, very important. And I think um, as an Emir, constitutionally, the governor is the leader of the mm -hmm. of the state. As an Emir. Uh, with all due respect, if I can put it plainly, is an appointee. Mm. An appointee that can be uh, removed at any time. You understand? And as such, I think uh, what really happened was uh, there was uh, there was on the part of the EMEA, by and large insubordination, mm. you know, to uh, the governor. Some of it people know, some of it people don't know. You know, of course, it's not everything that is out in the in the public. And as a, as the media head of the governor, I was just doing my job. Mm. I was doing my job. That I was. What uh, about the language? Don't you think it was a bit extreme? Uh, and it, uh, about I think it's foul mouth or is that? Uh, and uh, maybe maybe on that particular one. You know, easily we are all human beings. You can be carried by emotions. I'm sure if mm. you you said one or two things as a human that mm. uh, you you know. You, were carried by emotion. So basically, I think, yeah, uh, you know, we we obviously sometimes get carried away, but it's 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 only part of being human. All right, now let's move over to politics and governance. Now, um, you are vying for the office of um, governor of Kano State. What would you say in your experience, your upbringing, you know, and everything you've been through has prepared you 
to lead the state? Well, politically, uh, <clears throat> politically, I've been actively involved in politics for the past 22 years. I always love to say this because I didn't realize that uh, mm. I've played the game for that long uh, until recently because I was just just part of my life. Mm. So I've had um, political experience uh, one way or the other from electioneering to other aspects of um, the political process, different components, uh, you know, and um, uh, so politically I, I've had that experience. I've also had the experience of uh, uh, community development projects, you know, just working in terms of uh, getting help to the community, uh, to our community, especially those that are vulnerable. So, you know, that has also um, added to my experience. But most importantly, uh, I think I've uh, been in government for the duration that I was there, working with the governor, closely with the governor, you know, has really um, uh, prepped me up for, uh, for, for that role. I have seen um, the intricacies of governance at mm. that uh, highest level, at the state level. And I, 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 I think I've um, learned a lot, you know, that I feel uh, we'll be able to uh, get the work done if, uh, we, when we get elected, God willing. So uh, these are some of the things um, that uh, prepared me, and not just me, but uh, I'm putting up a very strong and competent team that will assist me in doing it. So it's not just going to be Dawis alone. You know, there's, I'm just um, the representative of the team. Mm. So we have a team, uh, experts, young people that are doing fantastically well in their different fields, different um, uh, chosen fields. And I feel that if we bring ourselves together, you know, everyone, this one handling this aspect, this one handling this uh, sector, you know, you know, with, of course, me as the governor coordinating all these things, I believe uh, will make a huge uh, difference and we've gone far we've gone far in terms of our plans in terms of our blueprint what we intend to do and, and everything mm. so um, come may 29th when uh, inshallah i'm sworn as the go next governor of Kano state you know i'm not going to start pl planning then you know we are going into government fully prepared fully planned and uh, with our blueprint with our agenda and we'll hit the ground running from the swearing in ground God willing. So we and we are, we 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 have been planning for this for a very long time. Uh, I can say up to seven years. You know, we've been fine tuning our ideas, our policies, programs. You know, uh, we didn't know that the opportunity will come in 2023. Yeah. You know, but uh, uh, we are happy and delighted that we at least uh, have a lot of ideas on ground that we can implement if we get elected, inshallah. All right. Um. Before we go further into your plans, uh, you mentioned a, a team. As of now, do you have, uh, have you selected your running mate? No. So fortunately, I have time to do that. Uh, uh, you know, as we know today, is the last day for the submission of the presidential and uh, candidates and their running mates and yeah. that of the Senate and House of Reps. But for the governorship um, candidates, we have till the 15th of July mm. to do that. So I'm consulting widely. You know, I want to see who I can bring on board that will balance uh, the ticket for us, you know, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So we are, co we are still consulting. I want to take full advantage of the time that we have mm. uh, to reach to a lot of stakeholders and make sure we get the right, right person for the job. All right, that's fair. All right, uh, now um, speaking about your platform, your party. Yes. Why the PRP, you know? Um, to, to take it further, why not the NLPP where uh, we saw that the, the APC um, government of the political party yes. in Kano State has been having issues and now a lot of people feel that this um, breaking apart of um, Senator Shekarao's and um, former Governor Kwanko so and um, that movement and mm. some lawmakers actually, uh, they feel that movement will, is, will or possibly splits um, or makes Kano states uncertain. Mm. Anything can happen. Mm. So why did you choose the PRP and you know perhaps not um, align with some of these persons who you were once in the same party with? Yeah. So a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, the most important is the political uh, ideology of these parties. Mm -hmm. The ideologies of these parties. You know, by a large, uh, you know, if you look at the parties, you look at their, which, which one of them is working based on its own manifesto, which where do, as a journalist, how many APC members or PDP members have you had 
talking about their manifesto or their principles. They don't have. Mm. You know, they have it on paper, but they don't have and they don't work with it. They don't even believe in it. You know, but I looked at the PRP and I realized that, um, you know, it has been in existence for 44 years. I don't know how old you are, yeah. but uh, it has been in existence for 44 yeah. years. You know, that's, a, that's a long, it's the oldest party yeah, in Nigeria. The oldest, yeah. the oldest, uh, oldest one. And not just about um, the history, uh, the, the years that it has been in existence, but it has uh, like five cardinal principles. You know, and uh, the first one is the protection of lives and property. You know, that's fundamental. Mm. You know, you have issue of um, democratic humanism that's giving power back to the people. Mm. Not just you have uh, governor controlling everything and so on and so forth. So you also have the issue of true federalism. Mm. It's one of the principles. So there are five, you know, and these five principles of PRP were the same ones in uh, 1979 when it won election in Kano and Kaduna state. They are still the same ones. Mm. And if you take one, just one of these principles and you implement it properly as a government, you know, you will solve a lot of the problems that, uh, that, that we are having today. Mm. You know, if you take the first one, which is the protection of lives and property, Nigerian lives matter. You know, if you take that one, you know, you solve the pr problem of insecurity, you solve mm. the problem of education. Almost everything can fall under that first one. Mm. You know, so that's, that's, that's one. Secondly, I, I, I feel, you know, um, there's need for change. Mm. In Kano State, these three names that you've mentioned, uh, Konkoso, Shekarao, and now uh, Ganduji, they have more or less been uh, rotating these things between themselves and their boys for the past two decades. Mm. You understand? And, and I've, I've, I've looked at the polls, you know, of the, of the state, the people, and I can clearly see that people want change. People want new set of uh, leaders in Kano State, particularly a new generation of leaders. Mm. You know, they are yearning for that, and 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 we realize that with that, with that, um, with that yearning for change, and then with a platform like uh, PRP, uh, we believe that at least uh, if you marry the two, we'll get the desired result that we need to mm. ensure that um, we we become victorious. So, so what we are trying to do is to tell the Kano people that we need a complete complete U-turn from mm. the status quo. We we have to do away with the the, the politics, the, the way they are doing politics, the way they are running the state. You know, we have to bring in fresh blood, you know, young, vibrant, competent uh, set of people to manage the affairs of the state. Mm. And this is what we are assembling today. We are assembling the right uh, type of team to do that. And by the time we unveil uh, our team and our ideas and I, I, I'm almost certain that people would really uh, you know um, embrace uh, this movement and God willing uh, will be victorious inshallah. All right now to one of the major issues which you've raised yourself insecurity. Yes. Now we see that um, certain governors in different parts of the states have had to become or have had to become um, creative with yes. the ways they protect their own states because even though they are called the chief um, security officer mm. constitutionally they're not really in charge of um, security so they have to skirt around the, the issue yes. what is your own plan um with the powers you have as governor mm. to do something that um, helps the uh, security situation because we saw just um, about a month or weeks ago uh, there was a if some sort of bombing that was being um, reported as a gas explosion, but eventually was revealed to be a bombing. And, you know, issues like this, we have kidnappings and all that. So within your own powers as a governor, how would you make a difference? Well, one of the things that I think we have to commend the current um, state government is on the issue of security. Mm. Kano State is at least the most uh, peaceful state in Nigeria. You know, uh, majorly uh, peace has been sustained in the state for the last uh, 70, 67 years. Mm. That's really commendable. And I know, being part of the government at that time, that uh, one of the major things that helped the state is um, uh, intelligence gathering. Mm. You know, there's, a, there's, there's intelligence gathering, there's synergy between the service chiefs in the state so the security the heads of the security agencies cooperate and collaborate with one another 
and there is also enabling environment that is being provided by the government. So these are some of the things that have maintained peace in the city. Of course, you know, as uh, people of faith, you know, we have to add that uh, we do sustain um, sustain prayers as well. Mm -hmm. But mutually, uh, uh, intelligence gathering is one area that I think we need to strengthen. You know, we need to know, for instance, in the past, in the olden days in Kano State, you know, when a visitor comes, the first place point of uh, contact he has to be taken to is the office of the ward head, mm. you know, as a traditional institution, mm. you know. So the ward head takes record of um, his information, where he is from, what business he's into, how long he intends to stay, and uh, where he intends to lodge. You know, all this information in the past are uh, very critical. You know, you just can't come in and just find a place and stay without anybody knowing uh, what your business is, what's your origin, and so on and so forth. So these are some of the things that we intend to strengthen at the community level. There mm. has to be community policing, mm. you know, and intelligence gathering by the locals. You know, that's one of the key areas that I think we need to strengthen. Well, how would you facilitate that? Or do you send people to the communities and... How do you, um, you know, get it from your point? Because people see the governor as someone who is unreachable. Yeah. So from that high level to community level, yeah. how would that pass across? Yeah, so they have a they have a already existing uh, hierarchy, a chain of command, you know, mm -hmm. that, they, that they use. You know, like I keep saying, it's just to strengthen it. So one of the plans that we have is to have a community uh, center a community center that consists of the office of the ward head. At, as, at, as, of, as of now, mm. he, does, he doesn't have an office. Mm. You know, he operates from his house, you know, handles issues and so on and so forth. So that community center would really be instrumental to the success of uh, what we plan to do. You know, it will have the office of the ward head. It will have the office of the chief imam of that particular ward, you know, and so on and so forth. It will have a guidance and counseling uh, uh, section. So all these things will be... Uh, digitalized so information will be keyed in you know onto the system you know there where the governor can have access through the dashboard we are in an era of technology you know with the, with the touch of a screen you can get this data and this information and you look at it you know we'll have a team of experts that will analyze this data and and see what what we are having you know we'll create a chain of com a chain of um, uh, information flow that you know can easily get to you know, to the relevant authorities immediately, ASAP. You know, it doesn't have to be uh, an information directly from the district head or the ward head directly to the AMIA or to the governor. Mm. You know, but it has some certain levels that it will follow, you know, depending on the importance or significance of the information. So all these things will be sorted, and but, but at least we have to have a system, mm. a digitalized system that will ensure the smooth... Um, uh, the, the smooth operation of um, the, the the system, more, more, most especially to get data, you know, and to analyze this data, and to find ways of um, you know passing this information instantly, so that the right um, response will be will be swift in, in being delivered to, to to address the issues. All right, that's fair. Now, um, kind of state is or perhaps used to be. I don't know. Uh, I'd have to. Um, uh, clarify it's, on it's, the current no, I'm talking about economy now okay. uh, used to be one of or is one of the most um, uh, would I say productive non-oil states that is you know yeah. that um, has a high GDP and all that yeah. now how do you plan to leverage on especially the industrial aspect because uh, it's kind of said to house uh, a number of industries yeah. how uh, would you be improving the economy of the state especially when uh, states now want other than being um, for the benefit of the citizens, they also mm. want bragging rights. Like, yeah. you know, my state generated this amount, this is my GDP, this is this and all that. So what, do you have any um, special plans to boost the economy of your state? So one of, um, we have seven point agenda that we'll, that we'll handle when we get elected, inshallah. Mm. And the top one is the economy, mm. economic growth. Currently, Kano ranks the seventh in terms of GDP in Nigeria, yeah. the seventh state. I think the first in the first in northern Nigeria, but generally in the country we are the seventh. Yeah. Now, how do we how do we transform Kano from being the seventh GDP? You know, to say in the first January to say perhaps maybe the third. You understand? 
and then perhaps in the second tenure to even overtake Lagos. Mm. That is our vision. So Isn't our that vision, too, too um, you have ambitious? To, you have to be ambitious. Mm. Dubai is the capital of the world today because it is ambitious. Mm. Visionary leaders have to be ambitious, you know, but you have to be realistically ambitious. You know, I'm not saying Kano in 10 years is going to be the, the, the top 10 cities in the world. I'm mm. not saying that. We'll get there, mm. but at least let's start with Nigeria. Mm. So we, we are looking at 10-year plans. So the, what we call, there is what we call Vision 2033, making Kano the center of commercial excellence in Africa. You know, in 10 years' time, yeah. from 2023 to 2033. 30, 30, 30. So the whole plan is to boost our, our economy, particularly the GDP, and ensure that we leapfrog, you know, to the first in 10 years' time. And uh, you made mention of the industry that we have. Yeah. So the two areas that we are going to look into uh, to focus our attention on majorly, you know, um, we have farming, agriculture, and then um, manufacturing. Mm. These are two sectors that we intend to look into, you know. And uh, the major problem the industries have, you know, like you said, Kano used to be a very uh, an industrial hub, mm. you know, but it was lack of electricity and lack of funding that um, killed those um, thousands of industries. Mm. So we have plan to ensure that we have our own um, power. They're using different um, uh, um, different components, like we have gas. You know, to power the power, especially with the coming of the AKK, hopefully by that time it will be completed. Even if it is not completed, we have our own um, plans you know, while we wait for it to be completed. We also have the issue of renewable energy, which will be a key thing for us. You know, one of the things we intend to do is to, you know, build one one megawatt of solar power. Uh, solar power particularly in the rural areas yeah. so that we can free the national grid of these rural areas that are not uh, consuming a lot of electricity so the the grid the power that is coming on the grid can be channeled to the industrial areas we also have uh, economic clusters where we will provide five to ten megawatts of um, electricity to power some of these industries so we have to focus on um, providing electricity and that is why uh, I think for the first time in northern Nigeria we're going to create the Ministry of Energy mm. which will be saddled solely with the responsibility of coming up with um, uh, implementing our, our power or um, power projects and policies mm. you know yeah so we have a lot of uh, ideas maybe if you can give me like four or five hours, <laughs> not 30 minutes, so we can deeply right. go into them. Yeah, maybe, maybe some amount of time. <laughs> All right, now um, just two more questions and then we round up. Uh, very quickly, in the interest of, um, you know, transparency, will you be declaring your assets? Uh, I did it when I was uh, special, when I was first appointed uh, the DG Media to the governor, and then when I was later on uh, appointed as the special advisor also, I had to do it the second tenure so i have declared my asset in the past and i also do it again i can even tell you if you want i have <laughs> nothing to hide mm -hmm. yeah so definitely we'll do that can and you say uh, it on air yes i have only one house mm -hmm. i have only one car my wife has one car and that's all that i have mm. all right all right that's fair and now just quickly in um, a couple of seconds um, pros um let's just planning ahead what would be your plan or how would you um, handle religious tolerance? Mm. You know, because we see that uh, in the past we used to have one situation in a year or two. And then now, uh, just in the space of a couple of months, we've seen some religious, um, uh, would I say, inspired um, issues amongst um, different religions. And Kano State is a hub where you're going to get, you obviously you already have all kinds of religions there. Yeah. What's your plan to create that unity? Because uh, I think one of the major problems of the country now is the disunity. People start looking at themselves as different, you know, putting more emphasis on their differences. So how do you bring people together, unite them? Interfaith dialogue, you know, you, as long as you keep communicating, as long as you keep um, relating with one another, you know, uh, you realize that uh, there will be that tolerance, there will be that understanding and cordial relationship, you know, between the, um, these uh, religious bodies. So we have, fortunately, again, you know, uh, in the past, Kano has some history of um, some religious issues, but recently, 
Uh, for 67 years, there hasn't been any. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe one or two smaller issues, but uh, majorly there haven't been many uh, major religious crises in Kano. So uh, one of the things that we will keep is to ha keep having a conversation with, our, with the different um, religious leaders and um, different religious sects that we have. We have to keep that uh, balance, mm -hmm. you understand? People have to realize that uh, you, you have the right to, to, to do your religion, like I have the right to do mine as well, you know, and everything, if there are differences, there are ways of resolving them, you know, and I think this is why it's important to maintain that interfaith dialogue, you know, to ensure that you keep bringing these leaders together so that whenever there is an issue, you will not say that you will um, eliminate everything 100%, mm. but whenever there is an issue, at least immediately the leaders of the two major religions, you know, can easily step in, you know, call their followers to order, and then, you know, come and sit with the government and see how that, that, that issue can be addressed, you know, as a whole. So it's important to ensure that that interfaith dialogue uh, is sustained, and, mm. um, you know, there's a discussion and communication between the two All right. religions. All right. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks for coming on Talk Talk. Thank you very Thank much you. for having me. Yeah.